Hello, my name is David Wright, and I'm a fourth generation rancher, but I like to say that what I do is I raise children so they become responsible adults in our society. I just happen to have a herd of cattle that helps me do that. So I was on the Nebraska Beef Council, I got elected to the Nebraska Beef Council back in 2002. And we had, I served a four year term, and then I got reelected to serve another four year term. And then right after that, I got appointed to the Cattlemen's Beef Board by Secretary Vilsack. And I did three years there, and then I did another three years on it. So I did 14 consecutive years in the beef checkoff. Now the other guys who talked today, they kind of stole, stole my thunder. Okay. <laughs> but they've all stole a little bit of my thunder, you know, they're kind of stealing off me here. But anyway, what I want to show you is the history of the checkoff. After, if, if somebody thinks you can figure this out in one four year term, they're crazy. Because there's so much stuff buried that they don't want you to know. Or they're not willing to divulge so quickly. So let's start from the beginning and or the way I've understood it. We know about the, the, the 1919 consent decree, and I could never figure out why when, when I was going through all this, I could never figure out why would you just start with the 1919 consent decree. Well, Bob Taylor at an OCM meeting one time pointed out to me that first there was what was called the Farmers' Revolt. Now this starts making sense. Now the Farmers' Revolt, which resulted in that, was the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Clayton Act of 19. Then shortly after that, we get what was called the consent decree. And in the consent decree, the Packers had to sell their interest in stockyards, warehouses, wholesale and retail meats because they were too big. And at that time, we had, I'm losing my spot here, at that time we had Swift, Armour, Morse, Cudahy, and Wilson. Those were the big Packers. 1921, we get the Packers and Stockyard Act now. And the Packers and Stockyard Act prevented, prevented Packers from engaging in unfair and deceptive practices, giving undue preference to persons or localities. Stockyards were, were, stockyards were forbidden from selling or dealing in livestock that they handled. See, they were already worried about captive supply in one form or another. Only stockyards with pins spaced less than a 20,000 square feet was what they were allowed to handle or to have. Well, here's what happened shortly afterwards. So you notice the government steps in, the government says, hey, you guys are too big, you're too monopolized, so we're going to put them in, try to, try to rein you back in. Well, the Packers, they get to thinking and they say, well, why don't we start a checkoff? This is when the checkoff started, 1922. It was five cents per carload. 25 head in a car load, and we're talking about train car loads. The Packers matched that five cents. The assessment was collected at the market. The assessment was refundable. The checkoff raised $70,000 that first year. Wilson Thomas, or Thomas Wilson, one of the Packers, he led the way to establish what was called the National Livestock and Meats Board, and their job was to administer the new family $70,000 that they collected in checkoff. And this was applied to all species, beef, pork, and lamb. In 1933, the rate went to 25 cents per car, penny a head. In 1953, it went to two cents per head. In 1955, Texas Farm Bureau started the National Beef Council, and they got 17 state beef councils to form to, form, to help support the, the state beef, beef councils and producers, and they paid voluntary. So, in 1963, the National Beef Council went broke. They went broke because they couldn't meet the obligations to the, their, for advertising. Those 17 state beef councils that were formed to help keep that thing going, they joined the, the National Livestock and Meat Support. They joined the Packers Refundable uh, Checkoff. And they formed what was called was the Beef Industrial <coughs> Council. Now remember, it's all, all species, land, so so when, they, when, they, when these 17 beef councils came in, they broke them into the Beef Industry Council, 
for the port committee and the land, the port group and the land committee. From 1973, from 1963 to 1975, we had seven checkoff bills that failed in Congress. All of them were opposed by the Packers Refundable One and Farm Bureau. Because Farm Bureau was thick because they're still part of it. You know, they, nobody else was going to get to do this. In 1977, we come up with a, with a referendum, the first referendum that we know as locally, or the one we have today. And in that first referendum, we had a million potential voters. We had 231 producers that voted, 130 voted yes. The, the um, confines to the, to the vote was two thirds majority, 56%. Said yes to the referendum, but it failed. They didn't get majority, and it was taken at the county extension office. In 1980, we made another run at it. This time again, we had a million producers. Again, we have 231,000 votes, but this time we only have 79,000 vote yes. But they changed the parameters from two thirds to simple majority. They only got 36 percent or 34 percent. And the vote was still at the county extension office. Now that that 77 and 80, that referendum wasn't a dollar per head. It was a it was a half of the action, half of the of a, of one percent of the value of the animal. It was a little more confusing. So by the time we get to 1988, we've we, we've changed or they changed it a little bit. They changed it to a dollar check off. They. Uh, they formed the, the, the Federation and the Beef Operating Committee. And but here's was the results. So now we got 256 voters that voted out of a million. 200,000 voted yes. They got their simple majority. So they got 79% said yes. And the vote was changed from the County Extension Office to the ASCS Office. So you see what we did? We changed, the, we changed the criteria. We changed how many people it took to win the vote, and then we changed the location the vote was taken. So we finally got what we wanted. And the reason people ask about that, why is that so important? Because in 1988, there was no farm, there was no farm crown, no farm program for ranchers, cattlemen. We do any business, we do it at the extension office not at the ASCS office. So how many people do you think really showed up to vote that had cattle? And they had, you know, there were cattle that were live with them. In 1988, 1986, before the NCBA merger, the Beef Industry Council, well, this is before the merger, the Beef Industry Council was the number one contractor. The Livestock Meats Board was the number two contractor. National Cattlemen's Association was the number three contractor, and they were giving five million dollars. I should back up here a little bit. In eighty, if you remember, in eighty-five, before the referendum passed, in nineteen eighty-five, we ran on like a, a voluntary. You know, you could pay it or get it refunded. We collected eighteen million dollars. As soon as that law passed, we collected seventy million dollars the next year. 70 million. In 1992, things started to fall apart at the Beef Industry Council. The pork industry, or at the, you know, at the National Livestock and Meats Board. <coughs> the pork industry group pulled out. The land committee group pulled out. And all that left was the Beef Industry Council in, in the National Livestock and Meats Board. That's it. National Cattlemen started talks about merging the National Livestock and Meat Sport. In 1994, August 5th, and I found this one year simply by accident about Christmas time, I was playing around on the internet. In 1994, this is a Senate hearing, and they're talking about the former, the, to form NCDA. And uh, Bob Drake was the guy who was on the stand, and Senator Feingold from Minnesota was just really giving it to him, asking all these questions, and Bob didn't have the answers. So he said, I'll get back to you. So you get to the bottom of the, of the hearing when you read it, the you know, NCDA or NC sends their 
their report back in, and this is what was what I found interesting. In 85, 87, NC only had 45 employees. They don't have, you know, they get remember, they're only getting five million dollars. No, they, they aren't getting a check off yet. In 93, after they got the check off, they're getting the five million dollars to the third contractor, they went from 45 employees to 80 employees. See what a little contract, a little uh, checkoff dollars does for you? In 1993, um, the, the NC's budget, 40, what I got here, 44% of NC's budget was checkoff dollars, 56 was non-checkoff dollars, 56%. In 1995, the Cattlemen's Beef, that summer, the Cattlemen's Beef, the Cattlemen's Beef Board had eight amendments to their bylaws. And in those eight amendments, they changed the joint committees and they changed to have their annual and their summer meetings shall be held with an industry nonprofit organization. The idea was they were going to try and get CBB, the Beef Industry Council, and the cattlemen all together for one committee. But some were wise enough to say, well, you really shouldn't put CBB in there because they're part of the government, you know, the Secretary of Ag. So in 1996, NCBA is formed, the National Livestock and Meats Board merges with National Cattlemen and the, and the Beef Industry Council becomes the Federation of State Beef Councils. Now here's what's interesting, that federation, those 17 states and all the other states that have come along since then, they are not a legal entity. They don't exist legally. What they are is a subsidiary, before they were a subsidiary of the National Livestock and Meats Board. And once you form NCBA, the Federation is simply a subsidiary of NCBA. Now to, to point this out, to help point this out, when you look at their, their, their structure, you'll see there's only one CEO and there's only one CFO. There's not one for Federation and one for policy. There's only one because you can't have two tax ID numbers. You can only have one. So no matter how, many, how you cut it, the Federation is NCBA. Now this is, um, I don't know why that's showing up so crooked like that, but anyway, instead. So the Federation, the Federation is a pay for play game. So like, I'm giving you, this is Nebraska. It didn't all quite come off, but we'll just this is, in, this is Nebraska's, uh, what we had to pay when I was at Nebraska. Our first two, our first, well this is, the first seats, one through three, which aren't on there, were like $34,000 a piece. Why do you suppose that cut that off? But anyway, seats four and five were 2.5% of our budget. $250,000 a piece. Seats six and up were 5% of our budget. $500,000 for that seat. Just so what? So you could be on the Federation? The Federation is a play to pay organization, and well, how, this is, I'm sorry here, but we're just a little messed up. So anyway, in 2010, the computer has taken this line and put it up here, but anyway. In 2010, there were 85, 82 of the 85 Federation directors were dues paying NCDA members. And how I know that is one of the meetings, I, I asked the question, how many in this room are NCBA dues paying members, and everybody's hands went up in the air. And I chuckled and I said, well, let's do it this way. How many are not dues paying members of NCBA? Three of us. So I suggested that maybe they should uh, accuse themselves for voting because they have a conflict of interest. Well, you know that ain't going very far, but I tried. I mean, I, I tried. In 2008, now we've got the number one contractor, the number two contractor, and the number three contractor are all within NCBA. See what checkoff dollars does for you? In 2008, NCBA had 126 employees. 70% of their budget is checkoff dollars. 37 million bucks. 30% is non-checkoff. And at the time, Forrest Roberts was the CEO he was earning $450,000. We were paying the checkoff funds, paying 70% of his salary. Now this is important because remember, 
Remember, think of NCDA structure. One CEO, one CFO, then they have policy, and then they have checkoff, but that's all. So they're taking, they take everything to 70-30 split. Do you see? So like when we had our, when we had our meetings in Tampa or wherever, you know, it was a 70-30 split. Checkoff paid for 70% of it. And Stephen paid for 30% of it. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? See what a little checkoff dollar does for you? This is an example of the beef capsules and that they pay, like I said, remember it's a pay to play game. So like Nebraska, where they tell us talks about with each one, when they send this money to the Federation, some of it's for beef, some of it's uh, USMEF, which is the United States Beef Export Federation, Federation Initiative, Airmark, Airmark for NCDA. But the check, this check, this $10 million check is written to NCDA. <coughs> They'll tell you it goes to the Federation, but the Federation doesn't have a checking account. It's written to NCDA. So that's the, the State Beef Council's collection. Now here's the Federation's budget. So an operating committee, I know every, all I know, all of you guys understand the check. If I know you do, I can see it in your eyes. The operating committee, the Federation, or NCDA, has got $34 million out of the operating committee. That's the CDB's half of the dollar. And then they turn around and they get $10 million out of the state through the pay to play game for the Federation. They got $34 million they're working with. But here's what's interesting. So the states of Central Federation, of state beef councils, they take their money, their $10 million, they spent a million nine on promotion, research, you know, all around that line. So they spent a total of two or five million six on on program costs. I'm gonna stop here for a second. At the beef checkoff, if the if the program costs or the AR is to go buy a six pack of Pepsi, it's a cost recovery basis. So I cannot charge the, the, the checkoff any more than what the cost of the six pack of Pepsi is. But I can then turn around and charge the implementation cost. What did it cost me to do it? So that's what implementation stands for. So we got implementation cost on this $5 million, 1.1 million, this is just in the Federation, which is state NCDA. So NCDA is taking the money that's given to them, paying to do the project, plus they're paying themselves with own money that they use they received. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so, uh, I think that's called money laundering. But anyway, this is a this is an AR, an authorized request. This show might find also interesting also. This is budget or a promotion, North American Meat Association, and they're projecting that their AR is going to cost. 600,000, their direct cost, you know, is 511,000, and their implementation cost to do that cost is 120,000. Federation of State Beef Councils does the same thing. This is NCDA's, one of NCDA's promotion contracts. They think the total cost is going to be 1.9, the direct cost is 1.9, I don't have any of implementation costs. Oh, by the way, the Federation is going to throw $300,000 into this particular project. The Federation, who is the NCBA, is going to throw $300,000 into their project. Isn't that nice of them? What big hearts they have. They're paying themselves again. So anyway, so what happens is, NCDA is allowed to come back. Let me do this again. Let's do it this way. Let's do it. So if you have competing contracts for a project and you're not an NCDA member, you have to show implementation costs. NCDA doesn't. So when, you've got, when you're looking at a cost, you're going to go, well, NCDA is cheaper because they aren't showing their implementation costs. They're allowed to come back later 
with a total information implementation cost for all of their research projects, for all of their promotion projects. That's a completely <laughs> separate AI. So this is research. Uh, down at the bottom here, this gets interesting. This was the approved budget in 2011 and 9. Two million, this is the actual cost, one nine. Two, two more. If you notice, for somebody who's just a little bit over budgeted, not much, but just a little bit over budgeted. So it's the same in implementation cost in uh, industrial information. It's the same in uh, promotion. It's a little bit extra, it's just, just a little over budgeting, no big deal. Same in promotion. Same in consumer information. And as a result, so I broke it down, the top line is the budgeted cost, the bottom line is the actual cost, and at the end of 2009, holy smokes, we were off by $1.2 million. Well, that's just a little bit. 2010, 800,000, 2011, $1.2 million. We're just off by a little bit. But this is what really, will really, this really ticks me off. So, NCDA has got a little overrun going in here on these implementation costs. And they put on here the operating committee has approved NCDA's request to move funding between operation requests resulting to offset and just for NCDA approved implementation ARs. Reduction in NCDA funding for CDB funding promotion. 2013 by 91,000. Industry information by 241,000. Will offset increases in research and offset increases in consumer information. So therefore, it's a zero budget amendment to the total. Now we have to vote to say yes or no to that. Well, if I hire a guy to fix fence around my place and he projects a budget. And he comes in and says, I'm a little short. I guess you bid for it, right? But if he comes back in and I got extra money left on the table, the other contractor comes extra money left on the table, do I give it back to the other guy? See, in my mind, that extra money should have been put back on the table for other contractors to try to get. But it isn't. It's just turned around and awarded back to the CBA. So over the 30, over the, I, this is over the years of total, total collection to check off of 2013. Of 2013, we had a total collection of two, $2.1 billion. So if you take another $80, $80 million for the next seven, last seven years, you got what, another 280, 280,000? You got $2.5 billion in check off dollars since its, since its inception. So are we going the right direction? You guys have all demonstrated that today. Our industry is falling apart. We're losing cattle, we're losing producers. The value is collapsing. In 1985, there were one million beef producers, 34 million head of cows. And today, when I wrote this was 2013, there were 729 producers, two 29 million beef, beef cows. Even NC, NC's membership was 40,000 in 94. Today it's 26. It's going the wrong way, but they can't see it because all they can see is the money. So this is the first paragraph in the Act of Congress start the check off the, for the beef check off. The very first paragraph says, to enable cattle producers to establish finance and carry out coordinated programs of research, producer, and consumer information and promotion to improve, maintain, and develop markets for what? For cattle, comma, beef, comma, beef products. Did you see anywhere in there where we've established a market for cattle? No. All the projects go to beef. So anyway, my daughter tells me that I'm too intense and I need to relax a little bit. 
but I don't know where to come up with that because we have banks <laughs> now, you know. So, um, a couple a couple things I'd like to touch on. You've all heard about the ROI, return on investment. For years, it was always five dollars for every dollar invested. Within the last four six years, they've done a, they've had Dr. Kaiser from I can't remember what university he's from. He did a return on. Anyway. Syracuse. Syracuse, he did a return on investment, and he came out saying $11 for every dollar invested. Well, here's the problem, because I've, I've talked to Dr. Kaiser about this, and he gets upset and doesn't want to talk to you about it. <laughs> what he did was he took only CBB's expenditures to calculate that. And then the administration cost, which is 5%, he took that out also. So the other half of the dollar that went to the beef councils, the other 40 million that went to state beef councils, that's not included. Do you see how your ROI is double? Because you're only counting half the dollars. That'd be like me going into the banker and saying, you know, Mr. Banker, it's a tough year, but you know what, if you take out my feed costs, you take out my, my uh, fuel costs, and, and well, you know, reduce my insurance costs, Look at my ROI. Am I not doing a good job? This is what's going on, you guys. So after this is all, after all of this, all these years on here, I've come to the conclusion that this checkoff, you all think it's your checkoff, don't you? Yeah. It's not your checkoff. It was never your checkoff. It's always been the Packers' checkoff. Thomas Wilson is rolling in his grave today because you guys passed in uh, Packers and Stockyard now to try and put them down. And he developed a checkoff and a beef industry council. Today he's got $80 million of your money and he's got a trade association that will go lobby for him. The only other guy I know would be more proud is Al Capone <laughs> because this is the most corrupt thing I've ever seen. This is a money laundering scheme, Capone would be proud. So, thank you for your time.